Our speaker this afternoon is Lawrence Hooper. He is the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Research Fellow and postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures here at the University of Chicago. Professor Hooper received his PhD in Italian Studies at Cambridge University in 2009 and has served as a postdoctoral fellow and visiting professor of Italian at the University of Notre Dame. He is currently working on a book entitled Exile and Authorship and Dante, and I'm assuming that your lecture is a part of that book? That's right, yeah. Okay, great. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Hooper. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. I'd, I'd like to extend my thanks more generally to the Lumen Christi Institute for inviting me to do this lecture, to Mark and uh, to Thomas, the director. Uh, it's, been, it's, 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 it's been a great pleasure to be asked to do this, and it's a very nice kind of uh, punto finale, as we say in Italian, to my, to my uh, time here as the Donnelly Fellow. Uh, I've really enjoyed that, so I'd like to thank the Donnelly Foundation as well uh, for funding that and making that possible. Uh, and also, of course, Romance Languages, everyone, everyone there, especially Justin, who's been a model mentor for me uh, uh, <coughs> for the last two years. And I'm going to talk today, uh, as Jennifer said, uh, about a chapter from, from the, uh, the book that I'm working on, parts of which come out of my dissertation and parts of which are kind of new. Uh, and the idea is really that I'm trying to, uh, at least in, in this chapter, have a look again at the uh, the earthly paradise, which is a, 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 a there we go. I've got I've got I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a divine sign there. Maybe <laughs> uh, he doesn't even know what I'm about to say. Surely. Uh, the, so it, I'm very interested, I guess, in in uh, my theme being exile. I'm interested in, in points that are difficult or alienating in Dante's work, and the and the earthly paradise is just such a passage. Uh, if you've ever gone anywhere near. Dante commentaries or Dante scholarship, you'll know that there are many, many long arguments uh, about certain passages of it. There's an entire book written by a chap called Peter Armour about what the griffin, who appears at one point, means. Uh, so so the, it, it, it seems to demand this very kind of uh, punctual exegesis, I guess, this, the, the, this concentration on small points. And I'm trying to, I guess, little overturn that a little bit, but also ask why, why, why that is. Uh, why that is the case. So let's see if I see if, see if I can do that. <coughs> Get rid of this. Many readers have seen the, the Commedia as a narrative modeled on Exodus. In this pilgrimage out of exile, the earthly paradise cantos, which fill Purgatorio 28 through 33, would be the point at which the pilgrim returns home for redemption in preparation for his final ascent to the celestial paradise, or Empyrean. However, the Paradiso makes clear that the pilgrim's bliss at his journey's end cannot be the poem's final goal, since neither the reader nor even the poet himself, as he remembers the experience, can fully share in it. I've given you a handout here with lots of quotations and some pictures. Uh, this is the first quotation. I'm not going to read them, though. I'm just kind of... They're there in case, uh, in, in case you want to remind yourself or in case you don't know the poem as well. Dante and we remain in theological exile from the divine presence despite the Commedia's best efforts. Dante famously incorporates his own biography into this theological division, reminding us several times during, during the poem that as a poet and historical figure, he remains a wanderer in bitter banishment throughout its writing after he was exiled from Florence in 1302. We, we could take the famous opening lines of Paradiso 25, where Dante, in fact, imagines returning to Florence via his poem. He says, ritornero poeta, in quotation two here. Um, his desire to come home, not merely in body, but as a poet, implies an identity between his own existence in history and the poetic language of his creation that we read today. In an echo of Christian discussions of history and scripture since the Fathers, Dante privileges his own particularity as an author and that of the poem he wrote, suggesting that these may have an exemplary role for the reader. Before he makes this ascent into the heavens, Dante spends the final six cantos of the Purgatorio in the earthly bliss of Eden. He locates the earthly paradise at the summit of Mount Purgatory, 
making it the last earthly location through which a purged soul will pass before its welcome into the celestial rose. As well as a homeland, Eden for Dante is therefore a borderline between heaven and earth. And it is this liminal, more ambiguous Eden that I will focus on today. As we saw with the celestial paradise, the poet's worldly exile cannot be alleviated by his protagonist's return to Adam's first home. Indeed, Dante's claims to election further emphasize his position as an outsider in the world that receives his poem. I'd like to argue that Dante creates a connection between his irredeemable exile and his st status of, as an author of vernacular literature, a connection which underlines both his spe specific historical individuality and his place within a literary community, epitomized by the choice to write in the Florentine language rather than Latin. I'll examine how this status as vernacular author in exile is highlighted in these cantos by repeated echoes of Dante's former role as the poet par excellence of the canzone. The canzone was the m longest and most complex of medieval Italian lyric forms, comprising one or more stanzas usually between 10 and 20 lines long, with an intricate and repeating rhyme scheme. If the shorter and now better known sonnet form was suited to pithy expressions of a single sentiment, often as part of a ver verbal jousting match or tensone, the canzone offers a long and articulated poetic space in which a poet could pass a reflexive judgment on a given topic. We might think, and this is perhaps directed at the, the, my, my classmates in, in Justin Steinberg's class that I've been auditing this quarter, we might think of Guido Guinizelli's famous work, Al cor gentil rempaira sempre amore, love always returns to the noble heart, which interrogates the notion of nobility and its connection of lo uh, to love. Before beginning the Commedia, Dante concentrated considerable effort on writing and theorizing these canzoni, which lie at the heart of each of his prior extended projects, the Vita Nova, the Convivio, and the De Vulgari Eloquentia. Moreover, Dan Dante's sole authentic entry in the, in the three late 13th po century poetic anthologies that have preserved many of the lyrics of this period is a canzone, Donne che avete intelletto d'amore, ladies who have understanding of love, which Justin would, I'm sure, like me to point out, was added by a later hand to the manuscript now known as Vaticano Latino 3793. The Commedia's allusions to Dante's earlier work as a lyric poet serve two purposes in my reading. The first is a literary critical operation that reinterprets Dante's prior output, and far from discarding it entirely, as some has, have argued, valorizes Dante's prior authorship as a vernacular poet of exile. The second is the drawing of a distinction between the commedia and the lyric tradition that places Dante's long poem in relation to, but outside of the vernacular lyric canon. And I will liken this relationship to the exile of the poem's author. You see why. First, I should give you a little context on the earthly paradise cantos because they are, as I said, very complicated. And I've given you here some, also some images that you can uh, that you can look at. Hopefully, they give you some kind of idea of what goes on. Uh, from, from varying eras, you'll see Beatrice making an appearance here in Salvador Dali. Uh, you'll see Gustave Doré uh, with uh, Dante uh, being baptized or rebaptized, I guess. Um, you'll see Sandro Botticelli on, page, uh, on, the, on the fourth page. Uh, with the, this is the chariot and the heavenly host around it, and you can see these are all supposed to be symbolic of different books of the Bible. And finally, a, 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 more, a, a more contemporary vision uh, has Dante here uh, being addressed by, uh, by this, this group of ladies. I, I guess the main, uh, the main point I want to make from the images is a kind of a sense of a kind of sort of choral nature of these people that are, that are talking to Dante, the sense that we have a lot of women, a lot of ladies present, uh, and the sense also that you, you kind of get it more, for, I guess, from the Botticelli than anything else, that you have these uh, strange figures that are, that, that, that are difficult to explain. I guess those are the main, the main things I'd hope you take away from it. So the main events in this sequence are, to give you a, a quick run through, is a pastoral encounter between Dante and a mysterious lady named Matilda, followed by the procession of a heavenly host, and in the midst of which the pilgrim's reunion with his beloved and surprisingly irate Beatrice occurs, and his former guide Virgil disappears. There's then a symbolic pageant of animals and monsters. Beatrice delivers a cryptic pro prophecy about the number 515, 
and the pilgrim is finally purged in the Rithi, rivers Lethe and Unoe, which, is, which I guess was supposed to be the point of him coming there in the first place. So there is little that is comforting or welcoming about this homecoming. Eden is the location where Beatrice harshly chastises Dante for having been unfaithful to her memory by devoting himself to other women. And I've given you a selection from her uh, rebuke at quotation three. Commentators have seen this as a reference to his lyrics and to the convivio. The protagonist's uh, difficulties are, uh, are mirrored by the readers. Many of the episodes just mentioned, Matilda, the procession, the pageant, the prophecy, are famously difficult to interpret and have sparked long disputes among commentators. There is, however, one point of consensus that's very suggestive for my argument. Readers ancient and modern find Dante's Eden profoundly disconcerting. Lino Pertile writes of the singular unease which the cantos provoke in their reader. I won't try to solve these enigmas today, but I want to raise them in order to underline the tension between the pilgrim's supposedly blissful homecoming to the garden and the manifold difficulties of Dante's Eden. I believe a focus on Dante's references to his previous work can help it to explain and contextualize this difficulty of the earthly paradise cantos, because I see in Dante's allusions to his own poems a recuperation of two prior models of authorship based in Christian notions of exile. Each of these exilic modes of authorship corresponds to a poem we find evoked in the earthly paradise. The first is from before Dante's exile, and here we find a vis vision of the poet as an estranged but exemplary figure, able to put forth e ethically advantageous material. In the second model, from after Dante's exile, we find a deeper link between this exemplarity and the historicity of the poet's experience that now justifies his difficult signifying practices. Both authorial modes suggest an analogy between the uniqueness of Dante Pilgrim's experience in re-entering Eden and the uniqueness of the poem that describes that re-entry, the Commedia. This analogy con connects the poet's banishment in our world with our own estrangement from Eden, as we read about it in his poem. Scholars have generally read the earthly paradise alongside two bodies of literature. First, the classical poetic tradition, especially evocations of the Golden Age, uh, in locations such as Metamorphoses I, and second, the te uh, text of scripture, particularly those books with strongly al allegorical exegetical traditions, such as the Song of Songs and the Apocalypse. In both cases, I feel there's a gap between the poem and its model. The Latin poets, for example, are explicit about the superfluity of institutions and endeavor prior to Jupiter's rule, so in the Golden Age. Ovid says there was no law, for example. i give you a quotation there from Ovid. He talks about the law being written on, I think it's brass tablets. But, the, uh, but Virgil's crowning and mitering of Dante immediately before he steps into the heavenly garden suggests a persistence of law within its boundaries. The persistence of human institutions is also significant with respect to theologizing readings of the cantos. As Kantorowicz argued more than 50 years ago, Eden for Dante represents the perfection of the human form in itself, the return to Adam's sinless state before the reunion with Christ. In order to understand Dante's Eden, we must therefore view it in the context of human activity as well as mi mythology or figuration. It is no surprise, therefore, that within this human locus amenus, or pleasant place, we find a reconsideration of the most important endeavor for Dante, poetry, and especially of the canzone form to which he devoted himself. That's why, as a supplement to these body, two bodies of intertext, I'd argue for a third, which is the Italian and Romance lyric traditions, as you can probably guess. And there are a few predecessors in this effort, although they're notably fewer than, th than the other two bodies of work that I talked about. We might recall contributions by Singleton, Barolini, uh, Sarah Stern Maddox has an article on the Rime Petrose, the poems of the stony lady. And there is one article by a lady called Patricia Grimaldi Pizzorno on relating Matelda to the canzone, the, the, the form that I'm talking about today, which is the only direct precursor I know, but which to, to my mind kind of barks up the wrong tree because it's not just about Matelda. Uh, so much as the earthly paradise uh, as a whole. More recently, this interest appears to be increasing. I see, I, I've seen several public, recent publications that anticipate some of the arguments I'll make. And, a, and I previously said out in my dissertation, there's, there's an article by James McMenamin and also by Ron Martinez in Dante Studies. Justin Steinberg has an epilogue to his book that, 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 I'm, that I'm going to mention at some point. And there is also an article very recently published in the latest issue of The Italianist by the young Italian scholars Valentina Arturo and Lorenzo Mainini. And I'll uh, 
I think we're going to be able to put up a bibliography on the, uh, on the Lumen Christi website uh, after the talk is done. My colleagues all note in differing ways that Dante's authorial self is necessarily closely implicated when he recalls lyric works because of his prior practice. But I do not believe anyone has yet connected the epic poet's retrospective glance towards the lyric to the exile's inevitable memorializing of his homeland. Instead, the dialogue between the commedia and the lyric is usually seen from a doctrinal and teleological standpoint. Seen in this light, Dante's lyrics represent a prior sinful form of writing that cannot subsist in Eden and must be purged, or at the very least, a less authoritative mode of writing that the commedia must surpass. But Dante's poem depends on the materials of the lyric tradition at a very deep level, from the use of the decasyllabic line to the modeling of the length of the canto on that of a canzone rather than a longer Virgilian book to the many ep echoes and citations of Italian, romance, uh, Italian and Romance lyric works that populate each canto. Even terza rima, the, the revolutionary triple rhyming scheme that each canto follows, builds on the metrical virtu virtuosity of Romance poets such as Arna Daniel, Guitone d'Arezzo, or Guido Cavalcanti. Uh, and you might think here of uh, things like the rima al mezzo, which uh, Cavalcanti likes to use, where the rhyme comes back very suddenly and then is repeated later uh, as a kind of nice little precedent there for, for terza rima, where you have a rhyme sandwiched in between two other rhymes. This formal connection between the commedia and Italian lyrics is more apparent in the earthly paradise than anywhere else in the poem. Bruno Porcelli notes that although six hours of narrative time pass during these cantos, there are no temporal references between the beginning of canto 28 and the end of canto 33. This lack of temporality, in effect, eliminates the Purgatorio's de defining theme of human progress, bringing these cantos much closer to the atemporal lyric. As Ulrich Leo once pointed out, the earthly paradise cantos are also the only time in the poem, with the exception of the very beginning and the very end, where we see the pil pilgrim as a lyric individual, unaccompanied by a guide. Thematically, the earthly paradise draws heavily on the traditional topoi of the Occitan troubadours and their Italian inheritors, especially the opening sequence of Purgatorio 28, which evokes a verdant springtime scene uh, in woodland, with a lady, of course. The, the significant part played by ladies in the cantos is also particularly noteworthy. Dante's sole interlocutors are Matilda and Beatrice, and the variety of his interactions with these two ladies, as well as the chorus of virtuous maidens who surround the chariot, who you've seen in these images here, creates multiple echoes of the ladies of romance lyric, lo love lyric, uh, which are studied in Arturo Mainini's article that I just mentioned. Justin Steinberg has examined Beatrice's breaking of the silence that she had previously kept in Dante's works. As, a, as an allusion to the many Italian lyric poems written in the female voice by male poets, especially Guitone d'Arezzo. And finally, as Martinez has highlighted, song is an important theme here and throughout the Purgatorio. The birds sing, Matilda sings, and even allegorical book, books of the Bible sing in the earthly paradise. And it is on the subject of song that I'd like to concentrate for a minute because I do not believe that anyone has yet analyzed the significance of the, of the uses in these cantos of the noun canzone and also the related word cantica, which are examples of technical poetic language derived from the verb cantare, to sing. Zygberensky once showed that this vo vocabulary of song is essential to Dante's definition of the novelty of the commedia. The canto, for example, had never before de designated a division of a larger work, and of course thereafter. It will almost constantly. For <coughs> before writing the Commedia, Dante had used the term canzone exclusive, exclusively in a technical sense to refer to this long poetic form that he privileges most in his own work. Only within the Commedia does he employ the noun in another sense, and there he uses it in two ways. And here, if you look at quotation five on your handout, uh, Inferno 20, line three, he refers to la prima canzone. So the Inferno itself is a canzone, the first canzone, uh, in order to in indicate the Inferno. Thereafter, he uses the noun only twice more in the poem, both times in the earthly paradise cantos, to describe words sung by members of the heavenly procession. In canto 31, these are the next two quotations. In Canto 31, it, it describes the imprecation of the three virtuous ladies who surround Beatrice's chariot. 
And in Canto 32, Matilda uses it to describe the heavenly procession's song. Then at the end of the Purgatorio's final canto, Dante coins the term we now use to describe the three parts of the poem, where he says, Piene son tutte le carte ordite a questa cantica seconda. All the sheets readied for this second canticle or cantica are full. So, that's quotation seven, I think. The, re the renaming of the divisions of Dante's poem suggests a transcendence of the narrower confines of the canzone form. Like, like Dante, the Purgatorio is in effect rebaptized in the Eden cantos as a cantica, a different, more liturgically resonant word. It reminds us of canticum canticorum than the Inferno's canzone. There is even a hint here of the novel vernacular manuscript forms that Armando Petrucci has shown were needed to contain the commedia's bulk. Dante alludes to the sheets or carte on which lyric poems would circulate, describing them as ordite, uh, prepared or designated, ready to be bound into a single large volume, similar to the one that Dante glimpses in the divine light at the end of the Paradiso. The Purgatorio sheets are filled not with canzoni, or even with the one long canzone of the Inferno, but rather with cantos making up what we now call a cantica. The word canzone therefore loses its formerly technical use, and applies instead to this spontaneous song of the heavenly apparitions. Dante's primary poetic mode, prior to the Commedia, is left orphaned by the elevation of its name. This orphaning process would seem to fit with John Frachero's now canonical analysis of the relationship between the Commedia and the Canzoni. Writing on the episode in Purgatorio II, where Casella sings the second Canzoni of the Convivio, Amor che nella mente mi ragiona, love which speaks to me in my mind, Frachero states, and I quote, when Dante quotes his earlier poetry in the Commedia, we are meant to perceive a distance, perhaps even an ironic distance, between a former poetic self and the poem that we read. I would accept this analysis of a distancing between poetic selves, but I'm less convinced by Frachero's implication that the Commedia transcends its poetic predecessors completely and without residue. Instead, and Ascoli has argued this, where, where Dante makes a retraction such as Purgatorio II, he often allows his previous mode of writing to persist after the supposed about turn. Ascoli helpfully pr pr proposes that the main functions of these recantations or palinodes is not so much to retract a prior opinion as to bring to our attention the person who is opining, the continuity of the author that, that goes between the two works. Prior to the Commedia, these moments of revolution in Dante are strongly associated with the canzone. The two narrative turning points of the Vita Nova, for example, the discovery of the prey style and the death of Beatrice, are each associated with a change in poetic praxis and the writing of a particular canzone, respectively, Donne che avete intelletto d'amore and Si lungemente mantenuto amore, as ladies who have understanding of love, and love has detained me so long. It's unsurprising, therefore, that just as Dante appears to discard his previously favored poetic form, he echoes and reconsiders his former efforts as a writer of canzoni. As in the Vita Nova, the recantation of a certain type of poetic composition goes hand in hand with a change in content. Here, the, the return of Beatrice and the rejection of Dante's devotion to the other ladies. But at the exact point that his lady re-enters the pilgrim's consciousness, the poet describes his feelings on seeing his former beloved again in terms that clearly evoke one of his canzoni, and one that is certainly not dedicated to Beatrice. This is quotation nine. And Dante can't even see Beatrice at this point. He's just realizing there's a, there's a fulmine, a, a, a bolt of lightning that, 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 that makes him realize who it must be. He declares, D'antico amor senti la gran potenza. I felt the overwhelming power of that ancient love. Echoing the opening line of his poem, Io sento si d'amor la gran possanza. Now I point out that this, this, uh, this line is normally related to a line in the Aeneid uh, about uh, Dido seeing, uh, about Aeneas seeing Dido, in, in, uh, rather. Uh, and as far as I know, until about 2001, no one had even p pointed out uh, th this very clear resonance. So that's a, I guess that speaks to the point about uh, uh, the, com the, at the commentator's attitude that, that I was talking earlier, the, the, the punctual analysis of the poem. 
This is one of two canzoni I wish to consider in the remainder of my talk today. The other poem is Tre donne intorno al cor mi son venute, Three Ladies Have Gathered Around My Heart, which comes immediately to mind in Purgatorio 29, when Dante describes three virtuous ladies surrounding Beatrice's chariot. And we saw those three ladies uh, nicely made out in different colors in the Holcomb manuscript, the last, uh, the last image I gave you. There are, these are two very different poems. Tre donne is the, is the great allegorical expression of Dante's exile, which makes a Boethian claim to righteousness in spite of his bitter misfortune. Io sento si, meanwhile, is an apparently erotic piece, probably from the late Florentine period, which uses the language of feudal servitude to express Dante's firm devotion to a young lady. Nonetheless, the canzoni share one thing. Each sets out to vindicate its literary approach on the grounds of moral probity. It is this status as prior essays in ethical perfection that seems to make these poems relevant to the part of the commedia that describes Dante's entry into a redeemed but yet still human zone. Formally speaking, there's a further link. The two canzoni are the only one in da ones in Dante's corp the only ones in Dante's corpus that possess a double congedo, or final stanza of farewell between the poet and his work. This is a significant fact given Dante's distinctive use of such stanzas to stand apart from his poems. He notes that the, in the convivio, while many poets congedi simply recapitulate the melody, he employs the congedo when there was a need to say something lying outside its meaning. The doubling of this stanza of estrangement suggests an extra quotient of alienation and self-reflexivity that anticipates Frecero's reading of the split poetic self in the commedia, already within the canzoni. My hypothesis is that these techniques of estrangement in the canzoni to which the earthly paradise alludes represent Dante's political and personal alienation in different ways in each poem. Already in these lyrics written well before the Commedia, we can see Dante constructing his poetic self as an alienated but theologically authoritative figure. When we realize this, the Commedia appears in much closer dialogue with its contemporary literary context, what we might call an association by birth if not by habits, as the letter to Cangrande describes the exiled Dante's association with Florence. Io sento si d'amor la gran possanza is a lyric that falls into two distinct parts. The first five stanzas, which form, form the main body of the poem, de develop a vision of love as cognate with political power. In Latin, potestas. And I've given you a quotation in quotation 11. You'll see the word potestate is there in rhyme position in line five on the handout. And obviously the word possanza as well would, would, would be uh, cognate with this word. The poet's willing submission to this power creates an alternate polity, internal to his own experience of love, in which his servitude, as he calls it, is the virtuous act of a civic-minded individual. So Dante takes politics inside himself in this poem, makes the whole thing a little uh, exemplary thought experiment, I guess we could call it. The two congedi shape the poem into a representative of the poet's interiority actually likens the poet, poem to himself in the first congedo, and acts to define an audience for his vision, which up to that point had been entirely confined to the phenomenological realm. Just as the poem seeks to match the poet's restraint, the audience must also measure, measure up ethically according to the first congedo, while the second, even more specifically, says that the poem should be read first of all by an elite group of the three least bad individuals in the poet's city. So very... <laughs> Very, very few will have access to this poem. Uh, as Claudio Junta has argued, this selection of readership by ethical criteria, which is characteristic of the Congedo stanza in poets including Dante, but also Cavalcanti and Cino da Pistoia, acts to personalize and historicize this apparently timeless lyric voice. The historicization emphasizes the place of the poet in space and time and furthermore highlights and problematizes that person's right to poetic speech in the first place. So even if Dante doesn't tell us who precisely he's sending the poem to, we at least have to think about who that person might be. In other, 
In other words, it opens up questions of literary authority and inspiration, exactly the questions that are at the heart of Dante's Palinode in The Earthly Paradise, where the canonical reading of Beatrice's rebuke has her ordering Dante to forsake many of his prior writings, especially those devoted to other ladies. So the ladies that she tells him to, that she accuses him of having been in love with, are generally taken by the scholars to, to represent specific Dantean works. Uh, the Pargoletta is one person who's mentioned, uh, and she's sometimes, in fact, associated uh, with this poem, Io sento si demor la gran posanza, because it's devoted to a young girl. And there are other, so it's put together with other poems under that rubric, for example. Io sento si is an especially interesting poem where questions of authority are concerned, because it frames the poet's negotiation with love in terms of a relationship to political power. Like other poems that editor's date to Dante's late Florentine period, Io sento si answers the challenge laid down by Dante's great rival of the generation before, Guitone d'Arezzo, that poets should discard the love lyric for ethical verse. The dating fits with Dante's political activities in Florence in the years leading up to his exile. And the, meanwhile, the dialogue with Guitone sets an intriguing precedent for Beatrice's demands for Dante's confession in the earthly paradise cantos because Dante answers Guitoni in this, in this canzone by denying that the moral and the erotic can be separated. The poem achieves this by first asserting the validity of the lover's in interiority. As is clear from the final stanzas, the poet's act of submission is far from an instance of meekness. On the contrary, it, it grants him a peculiar authority. We might even say auctoritas, to use a traditional counterpart to potestas in, in legal texts. Auctoritas is the, is the validating force that decides issues that are on the boundary between permissible and impermissible, a liminal function that presages the ambiguous st status of Eden. Shoring up Dante's implicit claim to authority in Io Sentosi are numerous re references to the ultimate medieval auctoritas, the text of sacred scripture. Zygbaransky has catalogued these allusions in a reading of this poem that has strongly influenced my own. And I'll just highlight the most overt, quotation 12. It's a calc of John 15, 13. Greater love than this no man hath, that a man lay down his life for his friends. As Baransky notes, this, this particular biblical echo adds a Christological dimension to the poet's submission. So he's not merely submitting uh, and gaining authority by joining the club, as it were, one way of looking at it. But he's, he's gaining a Christological status. The biblical intertext in the poem, poem's multiple evocations of servitude hint at one specific aspect of medieval Christology, what is known as kenosis, or abasement, of the man of sorrows, who is prophesied by Isaiah and described by Paul of Philippians 2. Paul writes, Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and in habit found as a man. So you see the evocation of servitude there that, that fits very closely with Io sento si demor la gran possanza. As Ronald Martinez has shown, the first Italian poet to explicitly claim this Christological abasement is in fact Dante's first friend, Guido Cavalcanti, who certainly would not view it as a salvific state. Io sento si's use of kenosis is part of Dante's broader attempt in the 1280s and 1290s to respond to and correct Cavalcanti. He does this by constructing a Pauline or Augustinian vision of the exiled poet, claiming that this outsider status he, he, he makes him a, the perfect representative of the peregrinatio huius vitae, the pilgrimage of this life. We, we find such a poet figure in the Vita Nova and also in other early lyrics such as La dispietata mente che pur mira, the mind that still mercilessly gazes, where Dante draws on the troubadour topos of Amor de Lugne, love from afar, to, tr to transform spatial separa separation from the beloved into a form of amorous exile. Iosentosi describes another such legitimated outsider figure whose withdrawal into inward contemplation does not negate the poem's claim to ethical effect in the outside world. So this is Dante's big bet, I guess, even early on, that, uh, that he can claim to be an outsider, claim to be cut off, claim to be abased, and at the same time have a connection to his fellow man. He, he, he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a such, he doesn't have such a, an, a, an isolated status that he is solipsistic. 
and and that I guess is his answer to Cavalcanti, who is who would say that no, uh, if you understood it properly, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to communicate it. For these reasons, Iosentos sees is an intriguing work for the poet to evoke in his long narrative poem, right at the moment that he re-encounters Beatrice. Although Beatrice explicitly demands that Dante reject the lady to whom the canzone is, is, is dedicated, Iosentos sees reappearance at this crucial moment validates his essential claim, that an outsider figure can acquire moral authority through a phenomenological exploration of desire. And what, after all, is the entire paradiso but an exploration of desire, as, as Lino Pertile has nicely argued. A drama of desire, he calls it. I therefore distance myself from the reading recently advanced by my friend and colleague James McMenamin, in uh, one of the articles in Dante studies that I mentioned earlier, that Dante evokes Iosento C at this point in the Commedia in order to dissociate himself entirely from its notion of amorous servitude. Dante saw the moral auctoritas, or authority, through this devotion to his prior love, and by re-evoking it in Eden, he aims to redefine and redeem that auctoritas based on a new narrative situation. So it's the same, it's the same Dante. It's not, the, it's not a... It, yeah, the, 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 the poet has not changed. Let us turn now to Tre donne intorno al cor mi son venute, a poem which is based in a very complex allegorical conceit, where the poet observes a conversation taking place around his heart between the god of love and three ladies, one of whom is identified as Dritura, and I'm going to translate that as justice, but uh, there, are, there are whole articles written on what that might mean. The other two ladies, after the Dictura, identifies only as her daughter and her granddaughter. And this leads to reams and reams of argu arguments about who they might be, whether they might be natural law and positive law as one, one uh, and, or different species of justice, or, or Aristotelian justice versus Ciceronian justice, all different kinds. The ladies' proclamation of their own banishment, so, th so they are they are also scacciate, uh, banished, leads the poet to identify his situation with theirs and to realize the virtues of his exiled condition. As with Io Sentosi, the drama of Tredonne takes place internally to the poet, with his assessment of external political realities transmuted to the tropes of the love lyric and then placed in dialogue with the narrator's psychological response. While Io Sentosi, offers very little evidence by which to date it, we can be sure that Tredonne comes after Dante's banishment from Florence because it very overtly de declares this fact in the fifth stanza. L'esilio che me dato onor mi tenio, and then this is. This is quotation 14. And I just note there that uh, that line that I've put in bold, the, the, the rhymes there, tenio, and then later on, about five, four lines down, denio, actually echo uh, the rhymes from quotation uh, 11, I think it is. Yes. Last two lines of quotation 11. Così mi tenio, ma fatto degno. So Dante is citing his own, his own prior rhymes uh, between the two canzoni, even. This is one of three times, th this line, back to the line, uh, l'esilio che me dato. This is one of three times in Dante's work that he applies the term esilio to his own condition, the other two coming in Convivio Book I and Paradiso 17. It's a significant event both for Dante and for the wider Italian tradition. Elisa Brilli has pointed out that exilium or esilio was not a contemporary legal term for banishment, which was usually described with words derived from bando, the document that announced a person's expulsion. So we find zbandire, bandeggiare, we'll find in a minute, mettere al bando, but anything to do with this, this document. Uh, well, uh, uh, we, now, we still talk about the wedding bands sometimes. Uh, the, the, that's just, just the same root as that, a, a, a document publicly declaring something, in this case, a sentence of exile. Uh, Dante's application of the term esilio to himself in this poem and in the convivio is in fact highly innovative. Early Italian texts before Dante had applied Asilio rigorously in two senses, either referring to the juridical concept of exile in the ancient world, or as a Pauline metaphor for existence in the here and now apart from God. So they know this word, Asilio, but it's not the same as bando, 
conceptually in a, to, to an Italian. It, 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 you can find it in, 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 the, in, in Justinian's code, but uh, it refers to a situation that happened uh, in ancient Rome. Or it refers metaphorically to the idea of, of being apart from the world. So Brunetto Latini's Rhetorica, for example, applies the term exilio to Cicero, but calls the author himself sbandito in the autobiographical prologue that describes his exile from Florence, a generation before Dante. Brunetto Latini, you may remember, comes up in, in Canto 15 of the Inferno. So he's clearly a, someone Dante has in mind. <coughs> Redonna's use of Essilio shows the poet developing the strange auctoritas we saw in Io Sentosi to incorporate this new biographical and historical reality. Dante now claims a status that belongs to an older and more universal juridical tradition than that of his condemners, Roman law. So actually, even amongst the jurists of the, of the, of the time, they would have seen uh, exilium as something that was not actually within the purview of a communal government, which only has... Uh, le uh, only has authority over its own jurisdiction. Exilium is something that comes from, from Roman law, from, from, from the jus commune, jus civile. It, it's something, uh, it, it's from a more overarching structure that Dante is fitting himself into. The legal historian Giuliano Crifo has shown that in Republican era Rome, the status of exilium was in fact separate from formal judgments of culpability, such as interdictio or sacratio. Instead, exilium is best characterized as a decision on the part of the citizen to respond to a disadvantageous sentence by taking himself outside of the city and the judgments of its law. The legal response would usually be to strip the exile of all juridical protections of citizenship, thus penalizing any attempt to return, but the exile would retain some agency in the moment of departure. In both the Convivio and the Monarchia, Dante cites Livy's account of the Roman gen general and dictator Mar Marcus Furius Camillus accepting the burden of exile. And in both cases, he uses this term, exilio, in the Convivio, and exilium in the Monarchia. And I, in quotation 15, I've given you the, co the Convivio passage. And you'll see that Camillus is bandeggiato, in fact. He, he, he does have a sentence passed against him. So that, that Dante uses that word. But he goes in exilio. And if you read Livy, then he's actually, uh, he, he decides. Uh, to go into exile. He decides to come back uh, and he decides to leave again uh, in, order to, in order to be honorable. He, he comes back in order to, uh, to achieve, a, uh, achieve a military victory that, that, that the citizens need him for. It's perhaps this nuance of autonomy and even we might say antinomy, that is rejecting the law, the, the, the attracted church fathers such as Hilary of Poitiers and Tertullian to this term exilium when they were seeking to encompass the Christian civic experience several hundred years later. Hilary in his De Trinitate urges Christian preachers to rejoice in this exile of ours and praise the Lord that the apostolic prophecy has come to fulfillment in us. He's been uh, sent out of Poitiers by the Arians who've, uh, who, who've conquered the bishopric at this point and he's, uh, he, he says that he, will, he, he rejoices in it. It's in a similar sense that we and Dante find the term in Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, where the imprisoned author welcomes Lady Philosophy into the solitude of our exile. One pr and of course, we might think of Boethius as a prisoner, but he does, in, in fact, apply this term to himself, this idea of exilio. Dante responds by conjoining Boethius with the term exilio in both the Convivio and the Commedia, making this mournful and intellectually challenging prosimetrum a clear pre precedent for Dante's post-exilic works. And Ronald Martinez, his name again, has rightly observed the many parallels between Tredonne and the Consolation, not at least that both depart from an encounter between an allegorical lady in a torn robe and an exiled author. In both instances, the status of exilium is very suggestive for Dante since it develops Eosynthesis' personalizing authority uh, and incorporates it into a juridical framework that is personally relevant to him and yet original within an Italian context. Dante's part in the very common experience of banishment becomes at once extremely particular in that no one else around him has suffered esilio, only bandimento, and yet universal, given the term's association with free will and the theological nuance that it had acquired. 
There are two very precise allusions to tre donne in the Purgatorio that make clear why its evocation of Esilio re remains relevant in Dante's Eden. The first comes immediately before the earthly paradise cantos in Purgatorio 27, where Virgil gives his description of, of Eden to the pilgrim who's just finished his final pur purgatorial dream. This is quotation 17. Virgil refers to Eden as a dolce pome, in a somewhat ironic reference to the Genesis story that calcs a standard Christian Latin metaphor for the ambiguous reward of theological language. So a sweet fruit, a dolce pome, maybe a sweet apple even. In one prayer to the Virgin Mary, Anselm of Canterbury calls Christian praise dulce lignum, dulce pomum, dulce onus, a sweet tree, sweet fruit, sweet burden. Very little attention has yet been paid to the fact that Dante had used this precise, these precise words, dolce pome, before, in the first congedo of Tredonne, where the poet commands his creation to deny to all the sweet fruit for which all stretch out their hands. That's qu quotation 18. And now uh, Arturo and Mainini have joined me on this and commenting on, on this, and they also see this as a, a kind of hermeneutic key to the earthly paradise cantos, although their reading is kind of a mirror image of mine. They, they, they would say that it clarifies, adumbrates is their word, uh, the, the earthly paradise cantos. I would say that it reveals that, 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 that they cannot entirely be resolved. This quotation echoes the method that we found in Eosentosi of emphasizing authorial historicity and subjectivity by seeking to define an audience. In Tredonne, however, the definition is, is tied to an even more explicit reference to biblical language and also to Eden, which had been evoked earlier in the poem uh, when, when Dante claimed that Ritura gave birth to her daughter at the source of the river Nile, traditionally located in the earthly paradise, although not, I should add, in the Commedia. So there's a palinode there if you want to. <laughs> you want to make something of it. Uh, the Edenic context of Tredonne even determines the hermeneutic with which the carefully selected public are to approach the text. The sweet fruit of exegesis combines with a further metaphor, that of language as clothing, canonical amongst rhetoricians since the classical period. Whereas the clothes of rhetoric traditionally brought decorum to naked, to naked subject matter, the nakedness of Dante's poem is sweet fruit which it will display to the right reader. So you take off the clothes of rhetoric in this case to reveal a further metaphor. There isn't a, uh, the, the, it's, you, you unclothe the lady and you find fruit. The emphasis on nudity as potentially dangerous knowledge, of course there's a nice parallel there, the nudity and the, and the apple, is reminiscent of Augustine's discussion in his literal commentary on Genesis of Adam and Eve's open eyes once they had ingested the fruit of the forbidden tree and for the first time recognized conceptually what being naked actually meant. This is quotation 19. Now Augustine introduces this reading in the context of a discussion of scriptural signification. Specifically, whether or not it's possible for part of a passage to be taken allegorically, the first couple's eyes being opened, when in fact they had never closed them, while the rest of the passage signifies literally the fruit and the nakedness. Augustine's discussion of balancing different kinds of reading is pertinent here because Tredonne contains, as I said at the beginning, one straightforward allegory and some more dubious figures. So we, have, so we know what one lady means. We have to figure out, decide whether to read the other two ladies allegorically. The poem's Edenic imagery reminds us that exile is built into both sides of our epistemological di dilemma. Either our knowledge will allow us to conceive of Dante and Dritura's exile, as did Adam and Eve's eating of the fruit, or the uncertainty provoked by our imp ultimately impossible exegetical task will represent for us the difficult condi conditions of our banishment. So whether we know or we don't know, we still experience uh, this peregrinatio. We still experience uh, Adam and Eve's knowledge that they gain uh, is not good knowledge. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not something they wanted to know, what it meant to be naked. The references to Eden allow the first congedo of Tredonne to read the foregoing poem via an Augustinian hermeneutic intended for scripture where incomplete signification is expected since the text deals with ineffable issues of creation and salvation. Sounds an awful lot like the Divine Comedy, no? 
Purgatorio 27's adoption of the phrase dolce pome adds a further layer of it and its significance on top of what we found in Dante's canzone, making explicit what the poem already implied, that our desires in this world, whether for knowledge or apples, are directed at an impossible return to the earthly paradise. Dolce pome is deployed here in a substantially similar manner, suggesting that Dante's former depiction of exile from Eden re retains validity even within the context of his new work describing the afterlife. Moreover, Virgil's remind, reminder of the poem Tre Donne prepares us for the fact that so many of the sequences in Dante's Eden exist at a problematic boundary between literal and figurative interpretation, as the second reference to the ca canzone in the earthly paradise makes very clear. So just to be clear, I'm saying that the, the Dante's not quoting that particular poem for no reason at all. It, in that poem, we, we had difficulty deciding who these three ladies were. In the earthly paradise, which is described by, also described by Dolce Pome, we will have difficulty deciding what the griffin means. We'll have the difficulty uh, deciding precisely what Beatrice means, both in her prophecy and in her rebuke. The, the second allusion to Tredone is, is, the, is the clear citation of its incipit its first line that I noted earlier in quotation 10. The common tradition, tradition has noted, but generally minimized this reference be, because commentators prefer to equate the three ladies with the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And on that MS Holcomb manuscript that I, uh, that I include on the, the, as the final image, you'll see the, the traditional colors uh, of white, green, and red. Any more significant relationship between the three ladies of the earthly paradise and those of the canzone has yet to be convincingly argued. Uh, there is actually a dissertation that, tr that tries to make this argument that Tredone is a key for understanding the Divine Comedy is the, is, is, is the title of the dissertation. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that it quite succeeds. I'd point out that even within the Commedia, this is not the only time three ladies appear. In Paradiso 20, the three ladies around the chariot are credit, credited by Beatrice with ser, saving the soul of the pagan Rephaeus. So they come back later on in, in, in the Paradiso. So they're important. Meanwhile, Virgil refers to Beatrice, Lucia, and Mary in Inferno 2 as Tai tre donne benedette, three such blessed ladies who care for you in heaven's court. The Paradiso re-emphasizes the three ladies around the chariot, granting them sufficient grace to save a non-Christian. This reminds us not only of the ladies in the Purgatorio, but also of the three in the Inferno, who are also on a mission of grace, but who must logically be distinct unless we are to believe there are two Beatrices, one inside the chariot and one dancing around it. As in the canzone, the, the, the phrase tre donne presents a problem of literal and figurative identification within the Commedia. If we pose the problem this way, we see that Augustine's description of partial signification is again relevant. In each, cases, in each case, the symmetries of poetic language and form whet our desire for knowledge, which we pursue by means of collating echoes and harmonies that pr prove suggestive but not conclusive. Only by maintaining what the philosophical tradition calls an attitude of epoche, that is suspension of judgment, can we product productively consider the meaning of the poem. The state of epoche is very often the point of arrival for Dante's exilic authorship. Take the Vita Nova's cryptic final chapters, which Michelangelo Piccone once showed depend on the motif of peregrinatio, or spiritual pilgrimage in search of God. So the end of the Vita Nova, in case you don't remember it or haven't read it, is uh, Dante saying his, his spirit went up to heaven to join Beatrice, who's dead by this point, came back, and he can't tell us what was there. He'll have to write another work later on. Obviously, that's, uh, people have linked that to the Divine Comedy, and uh, there's no way of knowing whether, that, whether or not that is true. <coughs> but in any case, it ends on a suspension. It ends on a promise to write more. After the exile, in Tre Donne, and in an equally perplexing text such as the Convivio, Dante associates the reader's necessary suspension of judgment with the historicity of his exilio. And I'm thinking of a passage in Convivio 1 where he says that the difficulty of this work is linked to the fact uh, that I have uh, been in exile and people have ridiculed me, that I have suffered infamy, uh, which is something that uh, Professor Steinberg has written about recently. This exilio now encapsulates the values of autonomy and difficulty that I've been outlining in my talk.
Now, the finding is clearly significant given the number of problematic allegorical rep references in the Earthly Paradise episodes. The identity of Matelda, we haven't talked much about her, uh, but uh, at some point I shall. The significance of the griffin, Beatrice's prophecy. The references to Tredone teach us that the poem's fruit does not consist in neatly resolving these enigmas, since any success can only be partial. Instead, it is the process of investigation that counts. As Augustine says in the De Doctrina Christiana, no one disputes that it is much more pleasant to learn lessons presented through imagery and much more rewarding to discover meanings that are won only with difficulty. Both Augustine and Dante suggest that there is ethical profit in a flexible analysis of the text that respects the particularity of its contents. Neither would shy from abstracting general pro propositions from this analysis, so long as these are limited in scope and morally appropriate to the individual who applies them. Epoche, or in Augustinian terms, peregrinatio, is Dante's answer to the most closely contested issue of vernacular lyric authorship, where the poetic language about love can relate to knowledge in an intellectually valid manner. And this is something that Italian poets have been discussing since the Sicilian school. Uh, what is this thing, love? Uh, and how do we talk about it? And if we talk about it, do we do something uh, that has some kind of validity on, a, on an abstract level? Does it relate uh, to the philosophical debates that are going on uh, in the Middle Ages over metaphysics, over ethics? In summary, Dante cites his own canzoni and the wider Romance lyric tradition in the Earthly Paradise cantos as he reflects on the potential for the redemption of human endeavor, especially his own art in this world. The repurposing of the very word canzone in this sequence emphasizes the differences that keep the commedia forever in exile from the lyrics and indeed from any intertext. But as I've argued throughout, the commedia retains its native connection to the Italian, Italian lyric tradition even as it wanders far from it. The canzone provides Dante with two prior models of authorship that he refuses to relinquish. One from before his exile, where the poet is a morally estranged figure, and one from after, where biographical, legal, and ethical alienation intertwine. In each case, a vernacular literary text claims access to biblical hermeneutic processes, demanding an equally flexible reading. Dante's exclusion thus becomes a position of theological authority, a status that guarantees the ethical integrity of his texts, even as he revises his previous work via palinodes. So to conclude by returning to the Palinode, to Beatrice's rebuke of Dante in The Earthly Paradise, rather than a straightforward rejection of earlier works by Dante, perhaps we can see this passage as establishing a new method and rationale for collecting Dante's carte. That's the quotation seven I'm going back to here, the carte of the Purgatorio, the sheets or bundles on which the exiled poet had previously published canzoni and now would ca carry cantos of his long poem. The key word is ordite, designated, where before the readers might have had their own rationale for collecting occasional lyric works, such as the canzoni Dante wrote, this new poem requires a set of carte corresponding to the poet's design. And you have to remember here that the, the Divine Comedy certainly started cir circulating before it was complete. So that it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's being written and being read in an incomplete state with the... Uh, with the um, with the prospectus of the final poem, but not with, its, not with it bound and edited as we encounter it now. This process inevitably excludes Dante's lyrics from the final volume, unless they would appear in margins or in, as an appendix. But we should not forget that the poet himself resides in just such a marginal space. And he therefore relies on a reading public scattered across the Italian peninsula to piece together his poem. When Petrarch, in his letter to Boccaccio, identifies Dante's poetic response to his exile as his greatest literary merit, he may well refer to this encoding of Dante's subject position in, into the reader's quest to define the boundaries of the commedia. Thank you very much. <laughs>